Hey students, welcome to Sustainable Energy. I'm Rudy Schlaf, a professor at the Electrical Engineering Department at USF. In part two of the bioenergy segment, we will discuss synthetic fuels, ethanol and biodiesel. We will discuss feasibility, environmental concerns and algae-based biofuels. The first part of this segment discussed the basics of bioenergy, of biofuels. In the following, I want to examine a few practical examples that are being implemented large-scale around the world. Uh, bioethanol is probably the most important biofuel in the United States. And in the United States, uh, most of the bioethanol is made by a fermentation of corn. So usually there is this happy picture that is being projected about this process. So we have the plant and the plant is processed into bioethanol and then in the car we burn the bioethanol and the carbon dioxide is then converted back to biomass by the plant and we can make bioethanol again and so we have this really nice and uh, healthy sustainable process. So that looks great, right? But if you look into the detail, one needs to appreciate that the production of bioethanol is actually a very complex process that involves many different manufacturing and, and farming activities. And each of these steps can be very energy intensive. And so there's a high energy input to go from the plant to the ethanol. And so it's very interesting to look into the energy return on investment, the EROI, which is essentially the rate of the energy output relative to the uh, process energy input to make the ethanol. And so in the following, we will look at these processes that are part of the bioethanol production from corn, and we will discuss the EROI at the end. So the six steps of bioethanol fabrication are, well, of course, first we have to produce the corn, do some farming, then we have to extract the starch that's in the corn, then we have to turn the starch into sugar, and this sugar finally can be used by yeast bacteria in the fermentation process, and alcohol occurs. Unfortunately, bacteria only like a certain level of alcohol, so this process can only turn out a mixture of water and alcohol where we have about 15% alcohol. So we need to distill, heat up everything and extract the ethanol. So here we get 95% pure ethanol, but for uh, engines we need to be better. So there is a final step of dehydration that takes out most of these 5% water that are still in there after the distillation. So in the following we will discuss these six steps and see what the energy inputs are and, and how they work. Step number one is the corn production. This table lists all the energy inputs that go into the production of corn on a hectare. So that's 100 by 100 meters, about 110 by 110 yards. If you look at the energy numbers that are associated with all these inputs, the biggest ones come clearly from fossil fuels that are used to drive these big machines and also to provide nitrogen in the uh, fertilizer. We will see on the next slide uh, why nitrogen has such a high energy penalty. So if we add up all these numbers, then we arrive at a total of 8,115 energy units per hectare to produce corn. Now the corn that comes out of this hectare is 8,655 kilograms on average and the chemical energy that's in this corn, so this we can directly compare with the uh, fossil fuel input, uh, that is 31,158 energy units. So it's about a factor 4 relative to the energy input. So here we really make some significant gain. So we can say that the EROI of this process, the energy return on investment, is almost four. So we get about four times the energy of what we put in. While this sounds reasonable, of course, every following conversion of this energy in the uh, corn will cost energy. And so this already fairly low starting point of, of an EROI of nearly four will shrink as we move towards the pure ethanol that we can use in machinery. 
We saw on the previous slide that the main energy input in corn production is the nitrogen fertilizer, the nitrogen component of the fertilizer. Uh, nitrogen is provided in fertilizer through ammonium nitrate. This is the compound plants can deal with. Ammonium nitrate is made from ammonia and nitric acid. So the big energy input is the ammonia. Ammonia is made from nitrogen and hydrogen, which is reacted to the ammonia compound NH3. And so you see here that the, the energy total of this reaction is negative. So we have minus 92.4 kilojoule per mole as energy cost. The reactor is fairly simple. We put these two gases into the reactor. We have a catalyst. We provide a lot of heat. That's the energy input and pressure. And then with a fairly low efficiency, we are making ammonia. And because of this low efficiency, the gas needs to be recirculated a few times until everything is reacted. So the heat and the pressure, that's a big energy input. The other big energy input comes from the hydrogen that is needed to feed this reaction. Uh, hydrogen is difficult to find naturally and so one needs to make it and the current way to provide hydrogen is through steam reforming of methane. We take methane and we heat it up with water that reacts the methane to carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Once we have the corn we need to extract the starch. This is done by cracking. Cracking is a purely mechanical process. The uh, corn is fed through a roller mill and as it goes through these rollers the corn grains are crushed and that exposes the starch that's inside. Once we have the starch the cooking process converts the starch to sugar and the cooking process means that we mix the ground corn with water and we add amylase and we heat everything up to a certain degree and then the amylase which is an enzyme that uh, helps processing the amylose and the amylopectin uh, to glucose. The cooking process leaves us with a solution that contains sugar. This sugar can be converted to ethanol by adding yeast bacteria to the solution. Here you see an electron microscopy image of such bacteria. These bacteria eat the glucose and they excrete ethanol. And this ethanol is what we want to use as fuel for our cars and machinery. The issue with yeast bacteria is that they can only survive in a alcohol solution up to 15% alcohol concentration. This actually defines the natural strength of wine. If you buy red wine, you will find that it usually has between 14 and 16% alcohol. This depends on the yeast strain that is being used. So we have now a aqueous solution that has about 15% ethanol in it. The next step is to extract the ethanol from this aqueous solution to provide it as pure fuel. This slide shows the distillation process schematically. So the task here is to remove the water from the water ethanol solution. And this is typically done by simply heating the solution because the alcohol has a much lower boiling point than the water. At about 60 centigrades, the water at about 100. And so all we do is evaporating the, the alcohol in the solution. So we use a temperature that's below the boiling point of the water. And then we cool down the vapor and we get alcohol in the vessel at the output of this column. One of the issues is that there's some attraction between water and ethanol molecules. And so this process always also liberates some water into the output of the distill. That is the reason why this process needs to be repeated a few times until we arrive finally at about 95% purity at which this process is at the end of its capability. Therefore we need an additional step, the dehydration, to remove most of the remaining 5% water.
Aside from the fertilizer and the harvesting, this is the single biggest energy input of the ethanol production process. This is the final step, the dehydration. This is done via pressure swing adsorption, PSA. And the process is rather simple. We have two reactors that are filled with a zeolite. This is just a water adsorbent material that has a very large surface area. And so the 95% ethanol solution is vaporized and then pumped through one of these adsorbers and the water sticks to the zeolite and at the output we get a dehydrated product. The problem is that this process is not continuous because the zeolite fills up with water and then at some point it becomes less efficient. So one has to do this with two of these adsorber units. Once one is full we can switch over to the other and while this one is used we can regenerate the first one by heating it to a temperature that releases the water from the zeolite and so we can pump out the water from the reactor and then once this one is contaminated with water we switch back to the first one and regenerate the second one and so on. It's clear from studying this ethanol production process that there are many energy inputs and that this probably also costs some money. So this study by Pimentel that we used in the beginning that also looked into the energy balance of the ethanol production process and into the uh, price of ethanol relative to that of fossil fuels. So this table shows the energy inputs again and this time for 1000 liters of ethanol once all the energy numbers are added up for these 1000 liters, we arrive here at 6597 energy units to make the ethanol. This compares with the energy value in the ethanol of only 5130 energy units or kilocal per liter. That corresponds to 21.48 megajoule per liter and that is considerably lower than the energy value that is in a liter of gasoline which is 34.3 megajoule. So we have about only two-thirds of the energy of gasoline in ethanol. Think about that when you fill up your car the next time at a gas station where they have 10 percent ethanol in the gasoline. If these numbers are correct we can say that we have about a 23 percent energy loss in this process compared to the fossil fuel that has been put into it. So it really doesn't make sense much to produce corn-based ethanol it appears if one is interested in finding new energy sources. Now I should note here that there are other reports that compete with this uh, Pimental paper where they come to the conclusion that there is a positive energy balance and that the process returns 67 percent more energy that we put in. Now 67 is a big number but if you think of it in terms of eroy, this is not even an eroy of two. So there is a lot of effort for very little energy gain if this number is true. So the entire discussion whether energy is lost or a little bit of energy is gained in this process may be completely moot if you think of the potential of using this effort to engage in different sustainable energy technologies. Now when we look at the price of the ethanol that is derived from corn, uh, the study cites uh, 43 cents per liter. The current production cost of gasoline is 33 cents per liter, but we remember now that gasoline has much more energy per this liter. And so if we take this, this energy ratio into account, gasoline energy, we can say, costs about half of the corn-based ethanol energy. So the bottom line here is that corn-based ethanol has serious questions that need to be answered before this process should be adopted in an even larger scale. Another interesting aspect is of course the total conversion efficiency per area. How much energy is produced per area from the sunlight that impinges on this area? 
So the first point is doing this calculation for the biomass. So here we consider how much of the energy in the sunlight is converted to lower heating value in the biomass. The typical corn yield is 8.7 tons per hectare per year and the biomass lower heating value that corresponds to that amount of corn is between 10 and 17 gigajoules per ton depending on the quality of this corn. Now if we use the average here of 13.5 gigajoule per ton, the 8.7 tons per hectare corresponds to 117 gigajoules per hectare per year. So on the square meter this is 11.75 megajoules and that can be translated into 3.26 kilowatt hours per square meter. So this is per year. So if we calculate the number per day, then we arrive at 0 0.00037 kilowatt hours per square meter per day. Now the average insulation in a corn belt setting in the US is about 5 kilowatt hours per square meter per day. And so if we divide this by the uh, kilowatt hours that come out of the corn, then we get a conversion efficiency of 0.0075%. So this is very, very low. We can do a similar calculation for the ethanol that is derived from that area. So we use the corn yield on the uh, square meter for this calculation, which is uh, 0.87 kilograms per year. And one liter of ethanol requires 2.7 kilograms of corn. So this corresponds to an area of 3.1 square meter that is needed to produce this a liter of ethanol. And so if we consider the lower heating value of this liter of 21.48, we come up with an energy output per square meter, which is 6.93 megajoule, which corresponds to 1.93 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. So per day, that is 0 0.00022 kilowatt hours per square meter. So if we assume again the 5 kilowatt hours insulation per day in square meter, this corresponds to a conversion efficiency of 0.0044%. So of course we get a lower value than for the corn, which is the starting point for the ethanol production, because we converted the energy in the corn into a different energy type, the ethanol, and that costs energy. This efficiency number, of course, does not take into account the energy balance of this process, the EROI. So if we assume the most positive value that I was able to find of 1.6 mentioned on the previous slide, so we assume that we actually get energy out after we subtract the input energy, and the factor is 1.6, then this conversion efficiency goes down to 0 0.0028. This is really minuscule if you compare it with the conversion efficiency per area of photovoltaic and solar thermal plants, which have values of about 4 to 5 percent, or if you take the energy cost of the plant into account of between 3 and 4 percent. While 3 and 4 percent are pretty small numbers, they are several magnitudes larger than the conversion efficiency of the corn-based ethanol process. So the question here really is why are these areas used for this inefficient corn ethanol production if one could get much higher return in energy terms with photovoltaics or solar thermal methods. Another main ethanol plant is sugarcane. Mature sugarcane stems contain 12 to 20 percent of sugar. The advantage here is that we don't have to go through the starch cooking process. We can directly grind up the plant and then start the fermentation process. But from there it is exactly the same like with corn ethanol. One has to distill and dehydrate to produce fuel grade ethanol. Brazil produces about 50% of the world ethanol from sugarcane. Here you see a summary of the sugarcane production process. This is a sugarcane harvesting machine and it works a little bit like a lawnmower. So the sugarcane is simply cut off 
and then it regrows. And this is one of the major differences to the uh, corn-based ethanol process because corn needs to be seeded every year and the uh, stalks that remain after harvesting are typically used to cover the fields to prevent erosion. Now with the sugarcane, because the plants remain in the in the ground, we can actually use the green parts of the of the plants that don't contain sugar and remnants after extracting the sugar from the stalks as biomass that can be incinerated to generate heat and electrical power that is needed to run the distillation process. So the sugarcane ethanol process is more energy efficient because of that, because we have a lower fossil fuel input because the plants can cover part of the energy expense of the processing steps to produce the ethanol. Unfortunately, there are two harvesting methods currently used in Brazil and other countries where sugarcane is a major energy source. And if the manual method is used, then a lot of the biomass that could be used for the distillation is actually simply burned off because then it becomes easier to harvest the uh, sugarcane because the plant becomes lighter. This process is still used in 60% of all sugarcane production, so the positive energy results do not apply for the manual harvesting method. The mechanical method, which is used in 40%, that leaves the plant intact, and so we have the benefit to generate energy for the distillation process. So once the sugarcane is harvested, the plant is simply crushed and mixed with water, and then we're ready for fermentation. So there is no cooking process needed because the plant already contains sugar. The energy balance of the sugarcane process appears to be better than for the corn-based process. There are several studies out there that evaluate the eroy. Here I'm using one study that found 8.3, so we get 8.3 times more energy out than we put in. But there's also a competing study that assumes in an eroy of 3.1 because of a higher diesel input number that was used. So with these studies, it always depends strongly on the boundary conditions of uh, which energy inputs are being counted and which ones are not. So the numbers for the sugar cane yield per hectare is uh, 69 tons, and the ethanol yield is in energy already is 132 gigajoules per hectare. So if we use these numbers, we can do, again, similar co uh, calculations like for the uh, corn. And so we arrive at efficiencies for the biomass of 0.049. And this assumes a higher insulation because sugar can usually uh, grows in a tropical setting where we have maybe 6 kilowatt hours per square meter instead of the 5 that were assumed for the uh, corn case in the uh, corn belt. For ethanol, uh, using the 132 gigajoule per hectare number per year, and again 6 kilowatt hours insulation, we get a 0.0073% final conversion efficiency. So this is two times better than for corn, but still we have a couple zeros behind the decimal point. If we consider the energy input ratios of 3 to 8, uh, this value then turns to 0.0048 to 0.0064 depending on which number we use here and so this compares still very poorly with a standard photovoltaic or solar thermal plant. But at least it seems to be clear that in the case of sugarcane the eroy is far from one and so this process may make sense if a lot of land is available such as is the case in Brazil for example and it is easy to grow sugarcane. Another difference between sugarcane ethanol and corn-based ethanol is that sugarcane ethanol is commercially viable. Here you see the price of sugarcane ethanol plotted against the price of gasoline and you see here that in recent years the uh, ethanol in Brazil has become cheaper than the gasoline price. 
Aside from ethanol, biodiesel is a popular biofuel. Biodiesel is made directly from vegetable oils with a fairly simple chemical modification process. Biodiesel has an energy balance advantage over ethanol because no distillation is necessary. However, there are some issues with regard to use of biodiesel in diesel engines. Biodiesel has a different viscosity under cold conditions and its storage stability falls short of that of fossil fuel diesel. There's also only a low oil content in most plants, which leads to a similarly low conversion efficiency per area like all other biofuels. The top molecule is a triglyceride and this is the type of molecule that makes up vegetable oil. Now vegetable oil can be directly used in diesel engines. However, because of their high viscosity, they develop larger droplets in the fuel injectors and incomplete combustion can lead to carbon buildup in the combustion chambers. So it is better to process the triglycerides to single chain hydrocarbons that can be used in standard diesel engines without a penalty. This process is done by adding methanol or ethanol to the triglycerides and with heat and a catalyst, which is typically KOH, these triglyceride molecules are split into glycerols and methyl esters of fatty acid molecules. A benefit of this process is that glycerol can be used in many industrial processes and so it can be used to substitute materials that otherwise would have cost energy to produce. So this adds to the energy balance of biodiesel. Transesterification of vegetable oils is energy expensive and it is also sensitive to the purity of the vegetable oil feedstock. And so there is currently research being conducted on using enzymes for the conversion of triglycerides to biodiesel. Here you see one of these enzymes, a lipase enzyme. And this enzyme is able to perform the same chemistry as the transesterification. The advantages of this technique are that no catalyst is needed, that it works in the presence of water, so it can be used on low quality and waste oils that are mixed with other substances. It is insensitive to inconsistencies of the feedstock, so one doesn't have to purify before putting these enzymes to work. And there is no heating necessary for this process, so the energy consumption is much lower compared to the standard process. The current disadvantages of this process are that it is much slower and the enzymes are currently very expensive. This table compares the most popular biodiesel feedstocks. The important columns are the production yield in kilograms per hectare and here we have the C10 number which stands for the quality of the feedstock. Larger C10 numbers are better because they lead to a more efficient combustion. So when we look at the production yield we clearly identify palm oil as the most yielding plant. It has a magnitude larger yield than soybean. Now an advantage of soybeans is that they need only a very low amount of energy intensive nitrogen fertilizer. So they have an energy balance advantage there. When it comes to the C10 numbers, the palm oil is also the best, but the used corn oil is pretty close. Used corn oil also has the highest lower heating value. So this is really a pretty interesting option instead of just disposing of used fryer oil, one can actually use it with high efficiency in cars. Like in the case of ethanol, we need to look into the energy balance of biodiesel. And again, we have a similar situation. There are various studies and they all come to the conclusion that the EROI is pretty close to one. Some studies, like the one that I'm featuring here, come to the conclusion that the EROI is somewhat larger than one, so a little bit of energy is coming out of the process. And then there are other studies, uh, most notably the one by Pimentel, that come to the conclusion that the EROI is actually smaller than one, so that it actually costs us more energy than we get out of the process.
So it's important to remember that the EROI always depends on the system boundaries that are applied. What do we count as energy expense and what do we leave out? But I think we can conclude here again that since all these studies come to the conclusion that the EROI is pretty close to 1, it doesn't really matter in my opinion whether it is slightly above 1 or slightly below, it simply tells us again that biofuels are very inefficient and that it is very difficult to gain a net energy benefit. So let's look at this study a little bit more in detail. It's interesting to see what goes into it as energy output. So this study actually compares uh, soybean biodiesel with corn grain ethanol and we see here the outputs compared with the inputs and the, the color coding in these bars they refer to the various inputs and outputs. So inputs is clear we have on the farm fossil fuels, fertilizers, we need to build machines etc. There's processing, we need to convert the biofuel into something that is compatible with engines or we need to distill in the uh, case of corn grain ethanol and so we need to build facilities and all that. Now when it comes to the outputs uh, we don't only look at the uh, fuel that is coming out the ethanol or the biodiesel but we also look at the remnants of the production process and so there are DDGS if we look at the translation here that's the distillers dry grain with solubles so that's the leftover from corn grain ethanol. This can still be used as feed for animals and so this is counted as an additional energy benefit because one doesn't have to produce that feed otherwise. In the case of uh, soybeans we get also a byproduct uh, that can be used as animal feed soybean meal. That is a large part of the benefits of uh, biodiesel. And we get the glycerol that I just discussed on the previous slides. So that's also a little bit of an energy benefit. At last, let's look into the conversion efficiency per area of biodiesel. And we do now a similar calculation uh, like we did for the corn-based and the sugarcane-based ethanols for soy-based biodiesel. And the numbers that are used here, they come from the uh, Pimental study. So soybean yield is 2,668 kilograms per hectare per year on average, so 0.26 kilograms per square meter per year. Soy contains 18% oil. So we can say the annual yield per square meter is 0.048 kilograms, so that's 48 grams, that's about 1.5 ounces of oil per square meter per year. Now the density of soy oil is 0.88, that means we get 0.055 liters per square meter annually. 0.55 liters, that's 55 milliliters, that's about one and a half shot glasses. To give you an idea. So if we want one liter we need actually 18.3 square meters. Now if we consider the lower heating value of soy oil of 33 megajoule per liter, so this is a good number, this is close to uh, gasoline, we get an energy value of 1.8 millijoule per square meter which corresponds to 0.5 kilowatt hours per square meters per year. So per day we divide by the days of a year, we end up with 0.00137 kilowatt hours per square meter. So you see already this is a very small number. Because if we compare it with the solar insulation, the energy that's coming from the sun in that square meter per day, which is 5 kilowatt hours, so this is many magnitudes different from this here, we arrive at a conversion efficiency of 0.0000274%. So this is really, really tiny. So if we use the optimistic study from the last slide that uh, got an energy balance of about 2 calculated, this efficiency is reduced to half that value, which is 0.0000137%. If you compare it with corn ethanol, where we calculate it's 0.0044, you see there are two more zeros. So 
corn ethanol out of a sudden looks great in comparison to biodiesel when it comes to conversion efficiency per area. Even if we would use palm oil, which has 10 times the oil in the plant, we may only be able to get rid of one of those zeros. And so we would still have an efficiency of 0.0001%. So I think the bottom line of all this is that I used the word zero many times and the zeros are on the right side of the decimal point. So this tells us that these biofuels are at best a niche product and it doesn't really make much sense to pursue them for large-scale use in cars and other equipment. Another issue with food crops based biofuels is that they compete with food manufacturing. On this graph you see the corn and wheat prices since 1866 and it goes up to 2006. And so you see that overall we had a significant decline in uh, food prices and that has to do with more efficient agricultural techniques, better fertilizer, better machines and so forth. The reason for this downward trend is that people continue eating the same amount of food while it becomes much cheaper to produce the food and so the food price goes down. This is called Engels law. If we look at the corn price over the last 10 years or so, we see that there is a systematic uptick and this uptick coincides with the ramp up of corn ethanol production in the US. Now there could be other causes for this price increase so we have to wait how this goes on. But the price increase led to the so-called tortilla riots in major cities across Mexico in 2007. And this shows us clearly that there is an issue with such price increases in countries where people spend a larger part of their income on food. This increase in food prices is of course a worrying trend since the population of the earth is increasing. Currently we are at 7 billion and it is predicted that by mid-century we may have 9 billion. It is obvious that this will create pressure on food prices since the space for food production cannot be expanded significantly. If we add biofuels into this mix, this will only add to the price pressure. People in the poorest countries spend about 70 to 80 percent of their income on food so if the prices rise only by 20% they will become priced out of the market and they will have to reduce their caloric intake. This may reverse a trend where since World War II the number of malnourished people declined by 50%. There are already 1 billion malnourished people. If one could find ways to use non-food biomass for the production of biofuels such as cellulose, the competition with food crops could be avoided and biofuels could be made from agricultural waste, switchgrass or wood. The main difference here is that we first need to break up the cellulose into starch or sugar molecules that can then be processed like we discussed in the corn or sugarcane based ethanol sections. Once we have sugars then we can apply standard fermentation and distillation to make ethanol. Let's look at one of those potential non-food biofuel crops, switchgrass. Switchgrass, you see it here, is a plant that looks a little bit like sugarcane and it can also be harvested similar to sugarcane by simply cutting it off and it will regrow so it does not have to be reseeded. So we don't have the erosion problem uh, with corn. Another benefit is that it can be grown without fertilizer but then the yields will be lower. The efficiency of switchgrass ethanol was investigated in a pilot project. This table is from a paper by Vadas. In their investigation they determined that the ratio between energy input and energy output, ethanol output, was about a factor 8. So we can say that switchgrass may have an eroy of 8. That is similar to what we saw for sugarcane and this has probably to do with the fact 
that part of the switchgrass plant can be used to provide the energy for the distillation process. There's also a study by Pimentel on switchgrass and they assumed that fossil fuel is used for distillation and promptly they arrived at a negative energy output. So the distillation is really the main factor in the ethanol production. If the plant can provide the energy for the distillation process, we can have an eroid that's larger than one. If the plant cannot, like in the case of corn, then the eroid is close to one. Now while it has that better eroid, switchgrass has a similarly poor efficiency per area as corn ethanol simply because the plant is less efficient than sugarcane in biomass production. Let's now consider the area that we would need to cover the US energy needs with biofuels. So here's a flashback to the space needed with solar energy. If you remember from the solar energy chapter, we assumed 5% solar plant efficiency, which is pretty optimistic. And then we came up with a total area to cover those uh, 80 terawatt hours of the US energy need per day. We came up with an area that is uh, 220 by 220 uh, square miles. And that's actually pretty optimistic, but let's uh, stick with this for now. So this would be an area like this somewhere in the southwest. Let's do now a similar calculation for biofuels. We assume 0.01% conversion efficiency per area. That's pretty optimistic, as you know now, all the fuels we looked at had more zeros after the decimal point. But this here makes sure that we don't overestimate the area, so we get sort of a minimum area that we would need. The US total energy use, again, is assumed to be 80 terawatt hours per day. So at this efficiency and at an insulation of 5 kilowatt hours per square meter per day, we would need an area of 1.6 times 10 to the 14 square meters to produce this amount of energy. The Earth's continental surface is a little bit smaller than this area. It's uh, 1.49 times 10 to the 14 square meters. However, we cannot use all of this since not everything can be used as crop and pasture land. Only about 40% of the continental surface are suitable for that. So if we take 40% of this, then it turns out that we would need about 2.6 entire Earths to only cover the US energy need. If you remember, the US energy use right now is about a quarter of what the entire world population uses. So if we wanted to cover the world energy use right now with biofuels alone, then we would need of the order of 10 Earths continental surfaces to be able to produce sufficient biofuels. So this estimation clearly shows us that it is absolutely impossible to cover our energy needs just with biofuels. Another potential issue with biofuels are environmental concerns. Like with any crop, we have to look into fertilizer use and pesticide application. Since we're trying to replace fossil fuels to cut down on greenhouse gas emissions, it's also interesting to look into how many greenhouse gas emissions are being produced per net energy balance, NEB. So that's the amount of energy that comes out of the process after subtracting the energy inputs. Now this study compares corn ethanol with soybean biodiesel and in the greenhouse gas emission uh, graph we compare with fossil fuel gasoline and diesel. Both fertilizer and pesticides, corn needs much more. Soybean seems to be very frugal when it comes to fertilizer and pesticide use. So on this level soybean has a clear advantage over corn ethanol. When it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, since we have such a high fossil fuel input to produce the corn-based ethanol, there is almost no savings over the gasoline. Since we have an eroid that is close to one, it is no surprise that the greenhouse gas emissions are very similar.
This study is more optimistic about the EROI. It assumes there is a little net benefit in corn ethanol, and so the greenhouse gas emissions are slightly lower than what we would get by just using gasoline. When we look at the soybean biodiesel diesel comparison, we see that there is a significant greenhouse gas savings. This is a result of the slightly larger EROI of biodiesel. But even this gain is by no mean a quantum leap. This is a small reduction that is not too significant. So again, the bottom line here is, why go through all this effort with the bio crops and conversion, etc., just to have these very small gains over just using the fossil fuels? So far, all the biofuels we discussed were derived from biomass grown on land. And we know now that all these biofuels have a very low efficiency, be it by area or by incoming energy from the sun. Now algae are another plant species that floats in the water. And algae are small, so they have a large surface to volume ratio. And because of that, they can be more efficient in utilizing the solar energy to produce biomass. Algae double in mass between 3.5 to 24 hours. They also have a very high dry matter oil content, which varies from 15 to 77 percent, depending on the subspecies of algae. Because of these advantages, they may have a 100 times higher energy yield per area compared to the usual plant-based biofuels. So this means we could get rid of about two zeros uh, of the efficiency numbers that we calculated. So there's a chance that with very high yielding algae, one could get close to 1% efficiency per area. Here's a table of various biofuels uh, or bio crops. So here's corn, soybean, we just discussed that. And here is microalgae, and they are compared by land area needed to cover 50% of all transport fuels of the United States. And so you see here, corn definitely needs the highest area. This is actually 8.5 times the entire U.S. cropping area. Clearly not feasible. Now, if we gain a factor 100 in efficiency, then of course we can come to a much smaller number, which they calculated in this study to be 1.1 or 2.5, depending on what microalgae one looks at of the US uh, cropping area. So with algae, it may be possible to generate a sizable percentage of the transport fuels that we need in the United States. Here you see a typical setup to grow microalgae. It's called a raceway pond. Raceway ponds are a continuous production facility. The algae broth is moved through this raceway track via this paddle wheel and feed is entered here at the beginning of the track and at the end of the track one can harvest the algae and so the whole process is continuous. The depth of these tracks needs to be shallow about 10 centimeters because there are so many algae in there that the sunlight is completely absorbed already in uh, 10 centimeters of this broth. Another method to do it are tubular photobioreactors. The principle is similar. The algae broth is being pumped through a set of tubes and at the end there is harvest the advantages of this design are that there is no liquid loss because it's a closed system and that the light can access these tubes from 360. So one paints the floor white and um, creates an environment where the light uh, hits the uh, tubes from all sides. One issue is that biofilm starts developing on the uh, tube walls and so one has to have a mechanism in place to clean these tubes. This is achieved by adding tube diameter sized balls or sands or the introduction of turbulence in the broth flow. These photos show a test site in Germany where these tubular reactors are being tested. 
Here they were combined with greenhouses because in northern climes it gets pretty cold in winter and so with the greenhouse one can save energy because even with little sun exposure one can generate a temperature on the inside that is amenable for algae growth. The uh, tubes are run in north-south direction so the sunlight can access the tubes via the gaps in between those stacks. The floors are painted in a bright color and that achieves a situation where the sunlight hits the tubes from all sides. Algae like carbon dioxide and so it is an interesting concept to combine algae reactors with the exhaust from fossil fuel power plants to capture the carbon dioxide that comes out of the power plants. In this interesting concept a triangle airlift reactor was built where the buoyancy of the carbon dioxide that comes out of the power plant also drives the uh, flow in this reactor. They measured 98 grams per square meter dry weight output per day in this reactor. And so if this were true with a 50% oil content in the algae, one could hope for a 7 to 8% area efficient biodiesel production. Now it isn't clear from this study what this area referred to, whether it is just the area of the tubes or whether it is the area of the entire facility, etc. Let's look at the energy return on investment for microalgae diesel. I found this interesting study by Slade and Bowen where they did a meta-analysis of a number of previously published studies on the energy efficiency of microalgae diesel. And there's a number of studies that considered raceway pond systems and a few studies considered bioreactor systems. So this is similar to the uh, tubular bioreactors that were just discussed. Now these bars that we see in this graph, they show the net energy ratio versus the study. And each of these studies has two bars. The bar with the asterisk, that is the normalized bar. So what the authors did, they looked at each of these studies and they tried to come up with factors to make the values determined in these studies directly comparable between the studies because each of these studies of course made slightly different assumptions and used different boundary conditions which energies to include into the calculation and which not. So the usual problem with these eroid determinations. Let's consider the ones that have the asterisks and what we see here is that several of the raceway pond studies came to the conclusion that the net energy ratio is smaller than one. We need to understand that in this study the net energy ratio is actually the reciprocal value of the eroy. So they divided the energy that was put in by the energy that came out of the of the process. The error is just the other way around. So what this means is that when the numbers are smaller than one, then energy is coming out of the process. And so we see here that for several of the raceway pond uh, studies, the error is somewhere between 0.5 and 1. It seems the energy that comes out and the energy that goes in is pretty close. So a similar scenario like for corn ethanol. And in other studies uh, we found 0.5. That means that we have a situation like with uh, soy-based biodiesel where we had about an eroy of 2. Now a couple studies also came to the conclusion that the energy is actually larger that goes into the process than what comes out. So here we lose energy by making microalgae diesel. When we look at the bioreactor systems where enclosed systems are used, the situation is much worse. Two of these studies came to the conclusion that the energy that goes into the system is several times larger than the energy that is coming out of the system as microalgae diesel. Only one study came to the conclusion that the eroy is about one, that no energy surplus is being generated. It's interesting to look at the components of these bars. They normalized for energy used for lipid extraction, so getting the oil out of the microalgae. 
for biomass drying and dewatering and algae cultivation and harvesting. So this is basically the energy that's used for driving the raceway pond or pumping the broth through the bioreactor. And so what we see here is that for the raceway pond systems, the largest part of the energy that goes in is for drying and dewatering. While for the bioreactor, most of the energy goes into the actual cultivation and harvesting process. And apparently the biggest energy part of this is to operate the pumps that pump the broth through the bioreactor. Because in these tubes, there's a much larger resistance for that broth to overcome than in a raceway pond. And this is why we have here these fairly small components of cultivation and harvesting. So the bottom line of this study is that microalgae are not better than the other biofuels in terms of energy efficiency. We can only hope at best to get a factor two out of it. And so we have the same problem like with all the other types of biofuels. Very low efficiency and a lot of effort for very small gain. So it's time to summarize this segment. We learned that plants are very inefficient solar energy converters. Most plants have an efficiency that is much less than 1%. The reason for that is that plants don't really like the sun because the sun damages their energy conversion molecules. So they reject most of the light and that's the reason that plants look green. Most use of biomass is currently through direct incineration. A lot of that goes into cooking in the developing world. Biofuels need to be converted to standardized fuels if we want to use them efficiently. So there's gasification and fish or troche. So we can get gases and liquids. But keep in mind that every time we convert an energy into a different type, we lose energy. And both of these processes have significant energy losses. Currently, most biofuels are generated from food crops. The area-based efficiencies are in the range of 0.001 to 0.006 percent. That compares to 4 or 5 percent for solar thermal technologies or photovoltaics. The energy balance of biofuels is close to 1. There is a lot of research going into this, but all these studies come up with either we spend slightly more fossil fuel to make the biofuel, or we get a little bit more biofuel out than we put fossil fuel in. So it seems that all these biofuels have the problem that the gain and the reward is very small in comparison to the effort that goes in. And in many cases, if we are unlucky, we actually lose energy through this process. Algae may offer a way for improvement, but current data shows that at least the present state of the technology is not much better than the other biofuels. The interference between biofuel and food production may increase food prices in the future. We already saw that in the past when bioethanol became very popular and the corn price shot up. Another issue with bioenergy is that all these biofuels, the feedstock needs a lot of fertilizer and there's also pesticide use and water use to be considered. So as a conclusion, I think we can say with confidence that the current state of the technology suggests that biofuels are not a very useful method to alleviate fossil fuel use significantly. This concludes part two of the bioenergy segment. Thanks for watching.